Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm Sarah Watt. And I'm William Chen. And it's great to have Sarah back with us. Welcome back, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back. <laughs> Five months away and I thought, maybe they've forgotten who I am. So what a pleasure. We realise it's been six months of episodes since Sarah was actually last with us. So the last episode we, we all did together was with um, Sarah's husband, Doug. We talked about Glass and The Happening. Um, I think that's one of the few uh, episodes where we've actually followed our proper format as well this year. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, we've had a few. We've had a few along the way. Um, but various digressions. And today is going to be another one of those digressions. Usually at Cinema and Context, we discuss two films, one current and one retrospective with some connection. It could be the same director, same actor, or a similar theme. But we decided because Sarah's been away and William's been overseas and I've been overseas, how about we talk about the films that we have seen on the road or in the sky <laughs> or on a ship? wherever um please be aware that we will be touching on spoilers in these films and we kind of can't really warn you at this stage what those movies are so just be aware we're going to be talking about a few films along the way and perhaps we'll say at the time when we're about to mention a film if we're going to wade into spoiler territory we will tell you to pause for 50 seconds or something mash that 15 second that's button. right yeah yeah but we'll try not to anyway that's i think that's a pretty good plan um, great. So I think we'll jump in uh, and hand it over to Sarah because Sarah has been uh, to some very exciting cinematic places. So, yes, yeah, Sarah, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about where you've been and what you've been doing in cinema land. So um, I had the enormous great fortune to take uh, five months away from New Zealand and away from work. Unpaid leave, I should hasten to add. But nonetheless, husband and I decided that we would like to soak up a bit more of Europe than just going there for four days in a village here, a week in a town there, and that sort of thing. Uh, And so we started off in Rome for a couple of weeks. Um, Because my husband is uh, even more into film than I am, inevitably, he's always, the minute we land somewhere, he's looking on the equivalent of flicks.co.nz in the local environment to figure out what's Mm -hmm. on and where and what can we go and experience. Um, and so, for example, in Rome, and I won't go into this in great detail, but in Rome, we went to a, um, a, f- a funny little screening of uh, a very old 1960s um, police caper kind of film. It was all in Italian. Um, there were no subtitles. And we basically, my Italian's reasonably good. Doug's is almost non-existent. So it was very much, luckily, it was, it was police and it was robbers and it was chase scenes and car scenes and you just go for the experience just to sort of soak it up but I couldn't tell you exactly who people were or what was going on but it's a nice experience to have in the heart of Rome round the corner from the Trevi Fountain you know seeing a local film but then more significantly we then spent a month in Paris and the Cinémathèque Française um, which is like the which is their National Film Institute Um, does wonderful things with putting on uh, specialist programs. So the highlights at the Cinémathèque Française included, uh, in no particular order, seeing um, La Dolce Vita, all like, is it two and a half, three hours worth of it, in Italian with French subtitles. Now, I may have mentioned, my Italian is reasonably good, but it is not good enough to be able to Uh, watch a whole film in Italian and understand fully. My French is probably better than my Italian and my reading of French is is fine. So I worked super hard in that film to (laughs) hear, but more importantly, to read what was going on. Again, bless the husband, with neither French nor Italian particularly, but having seen the film before, managed to, you know, to enjoy it um, about as much as you possibly can. That was my first time, I think, watching the whole film and really soaking it up and enjoying it as an amazing experience. So that was kind of a cool semi-educational thing to do because I had to work hard for it. And you'd been by the Trivia Fountain, I guess, a week or so earlier? Yeah, exactly right, exactly. And so the wonderful thing about this trip that we've just been on, we we went from Italy to France to Italy to France to Italy again and that sort of thing. And so to then see all these films that are European and filmed in Europe, inevitably there's that thrill of, oh, look, round the corner from there is that restaurant we went to or whatever because of course I was going to say Europe doesn't change obviously Europe changes and develops but fundamental things like the Pantheon and the Colosseum and the Trevi Fountain uh, and the Champs-Élysées 
they don't change. So you see them in a film that was filmed in the 60s, and it's like that now, um, barring the tourists. So talking about uh, a good segue, mm. how much of a fantasy is the scene in La Dolce Vita where nobody is around the tree of fountain, yeah. except for a small kitten? Yeah, no, it, t- it totally is. So <laughs> <coughs> one of the joys of being in Rome is we went to the Cinecittà film studios, Um, and learned a whole bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff. And if I remember rightly, and I bet all our many, many millions of listeners will write in and tell me that I'm wrong, but if I remember rightly, um, he shot the Trevi Fountain scene. um, It was obviously overnight, so therefore veering into very early in the morning. She, um, interestingly, so Anita Ekberg, Mm -hmm. uh, with the gorgeous blonde hair and that fantastic black cleavage dress is wearing waders like fishermen's waders underneath her dress just for a little bit of extra warmth um but i understand that there there were some um i think paparazzi actually but there were some civilians if you will um in the vicinity but not so many that it was difficult to 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 Mm. keep them back from that scene so otherwise that's that's how they managed to conjure up it's being just her and marcello mastroani in that it's a hugely uh, peaceful environment. Absolutely. I know from my from my friends that have been there, they're like, you can barely even get it's close to the ridiculous. <laughs> there, I, and look, there's a you know, there's a whole other podcast to be had about the difference between the fantasy of a place and the reality of being there. And the impossibility of going to the Trevi Fountain and being able to conjure up any feeling whatsoever of what it was like or could be like or might have been like. You just don't get any of that at all. And then you think, damn these tourists, I wish they'd leave. And then you realise with a moment of self-reflection that you <laughs> you are contributing to that tourism <laughs> and that they all wish that you would leave as well. And, you know, I mean, that's just an inevitability, I think, of... of of modern travel, isn't it? It's like my parents are overseas in Europe at the moment, and they and I got all these photos through them recreating Abbey Road with mm, <laughs> mm. with just other people trying to recreate Abbey Road. Exactly. So you got the four of my, my auntie and uncle there too, the four of them plus a random few other people yeah. trying to recreate the walk <laughs> with cars behind them waiting. And I'm like, oh gosh. And other yeah. people lining up waiting for their moment to cross that particular pedestrian crossing. Absolutely, that's just how it is. Well, it's like everybody with the Instagram shots of um, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah. the yeah. platform nine and three quarters. <laughs> and it's like a huge queue waiting yeah. to just do the, the same shot. One hour, one yeah. hour. One hour, have you yeah. done it? I did, I did. <laughs> with friends. I would, so, I would so do it. You get to choose your wand and everything. <laughs> very, very professional, very friendly people. Oh, that's nice. nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, I will just say, at the Cinema des Francaises, Nicholas Winding Refn was there. He had um, curated a series of films that had inspired him, and we got to what, rewatch Drive um, in a terrific format, and that was thrilling. We got to hear him speak, which was less thrilling. <laughs> I, uh, there's a whole other podcast um, around slagging off um, luminaries that you see for real um, doing talks and thinking, really, kind of you're a bit of a douche sometimes, you know, but whatever. He's made some lovely work. But the highlight for me was a Steadicam masterclass with Garrett Brown, who is the inventor of the Steadicam. Wow. It was extraordinary. He had a PowerPoint presentation. (laughs) He had videos and designs. He stood up and he showed us his... um, how he had come up with the very first um, prototype for a Steadicam um, (laughs) arm sort of thing. Uh, He showed us footage from the films that he had shot, including obviously very famously in uh, Rocky, um, running up the steps in Philadelphia and that sort of thing. And it was absolutely thrilling. And I realized, and me and all the other film nerds in the room, you know, we were completely buzzing out. And he's right there. He's still alive because he's not even that old. He must be 60s, if that, maybe early 70s. And when you think, good Lord, we have grown up with steady cam shots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet here is the guy that we have to, to thank for some of the most wonderful um, scenes in cinema history. Oh, that was absolutely fascinating. Wow. So, so to be able to go to things like that by dint of being in a place like Paris, it's like, you know, LA, New York, Paris are the sorts of... Auckland, no, not so much. We're mm. not going to get somebody like that mm. um, as readily. So that, that was a real privilege. That makes me think of, just in terms of cinematic pioneers, I used to work at the Embassy Theatre in Wellington and there was... At the time, the downstairs area, which had once upon a time been the stalls, mm. you know, and then had been converted in the 1970s to, I think, office blocks. 
and then in the early 2000s mm. they reconverted it back to the potential of having some smaller cinemas down there but it was just concrete shells with rubbish and now all of our rubbish bins would be down there mm. and there was a door at the side you know the, the fire exit doors where mm-hmm. you press the mm-hmm, metal mm-hmm. plate and it pulls the two bits of, of metal rods to, so you can quickly get out of the doors and I always thought oh this is this the oldest kind of crappiest looking version of these doors like it wasn't the, the, the kind of ones we'd come to know it looked like somebody had sort of jimmied this thing together yeah um, and you know, it was this really rickety door that I'm sure you could have easily got in if you wanted to from the other side. Um, and I was looking through a book that I've got, which is about cinema history in New Zealand. And I was look, reading the the Embassy Theatre page or something about project, projectionists, mm-hmm. and kind of the mm. the um, ingenuity of projectionists. Mm. And it said such and such, who was the projectionist of the Embassy Theatre, invented modern day fire doors. Good lord! By by pu- by putting t- a piece of metal and two rods, and it's now become the well, you know, to get around the fire laws, it's become sort of the, the standard. Wow! And I'm and like, so that was. I it. reckon that's one of the original <laughs> fire doors. <coughs> not quite, not quite the steady cam, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was definitely a moment for me. That door's now gone because health can... and safety is important, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? So you know, it still counts. The door's gone yeah. now. It's been converted into a, a lovely little uh, cocktail bar, but. Yeah, there was a time where I was touching the original fire door invented yeah. by the Embassy Theatre projectionist. Wow, and you didn't even know. <laughs> I had no idea. True. Yeah. Anyways, carry on, carry on. Well, I, I think, but I mean, um, well, I will briefly say then, we went and spent a month in Tuscany. And I have to be honest with you, I wasn't exactly filmed out, but I thought, won't it be nice? We're in a tiny little village. Um, we're at least an hour from Florence. In fact, we only went and we only saw one English language blockbustery film, and that was in Florence, and that was um, Avengers Endgame, um, which curiously stopped. We were, had been told there would be an intermission, hmm. uh, and it, but the way that they did it is, and I don't care if this is a spoiler, there is a moment. Have we all seen it? Yes. Right, so there's the moment where Thor is, is chatting with his mum, and all of a sudden... The film paused, the oh. lights came up, everybody went out, bought a beer and popcorn, and then came back in 15 minutes later, and, and, and we're back. Which so I it's think. just just pretty much cut halfway in the middle. It was it? just like, okay, we've got to do this thing. <laughs> so that was the intermission, which felt a little clumsy, a little awkward. <laughs> what did you think of the film? Oh, um, I, didn't, I didn't think enough worth talking about. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, we talked about it well, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. I, I personally preferred, in, uh, what's the one before it? I think Infinity I, War. In, Infinity I, War. I did. I found Infinity War much more um, moving and all that sort of ah. thing. So there were nice moments for me in Endgame, but I, I don't have any fulsome thoughts about mm-hmm. it, particularly. <laughs> but all I was going to say is the Tuscany month was not about film, except that... We turned up in our little village. Husband gets his phone out just to see if... uh, Actually, I think he was looking to see where Avengers Endgame might be on. And it turned out that Luca, which was a 34-minute drive from where we were staying, was having a film festival the first (laughs) weekend that we were there. So for the first five days of our trip, we were were making jaunts into Luca, which is the most beautiful medieval walled city. It's absolutely gorgeous and Mm. worth a visit every time we go to Italy. And would you believe, while we were at the Luca Film Festival, we went to a masterclass, which was more of a rambling conversation, with Rutger Hauer. <laughs> wow. Who, as Goodness you may gracious. recall, just left this mortal coil about two weeks ago. No, has he passed away? He yeah. just passed away two weeks ago. Oh, I didn't know that. Your That's mate right. from Blade Runner. Yeah, Tears in the Rain and all that. So he, oh, oh, bless is... him, mm. now I feel a bit stink, because at the time we weren't very impressed with his sort of conversation skills or anything. I think what happened was they bill everything as a masterclass, but then the luminary will come along, and sometimes for them it's just it's just a chat. Mm-hmm. And he was very nice and well-meaning, but it did feel somewhat like Trump, um, not in terms of bigotry and hatred, <laughs> but just in terms of rambling, not really saying it, it very much mm. for the most part. But it, so we got to see him, but it wasn't all that. Um, we, we watched the premiere of the uh, the Ted Bundy movie starring Zac Efron, which was terrific. Mm-hmm. Um, but the highlight for the Luca Film Festival was a masterclass, which was a masterclass, with Joe Dante, director of Gremlins, yes. Gremlins 2, many other films that my colleague here, William Chen, would be able to <laughs> rattle off, and his counterpart, Mick Garris, 
Um, and these are the masters of horrors, masters of horror, gentlemen. They talked about Hollywood in the 80s working um, at Amblin under Spielberg. Uh, and they talked about the craft and it was so interesting. And once again, it was one of those situations where you are literally in a tiny little town in the middle of Tuscany. And these Hollywood um, <sighs> stalwarts come and spoke intelligently and warmly about the state of cinema today, the state of Netflix and uh, streaming, mm-hmm. um, the the way that people shoot movies, et cetera, et cetera, and all that. And that was really fascinating. Wow. So, yeah. So, yeah, let's hear from somebody else who sees it first <laughs> before we then come back and talk about Can. Yeah. Wow. William, do you want to Amazing. jump in? What are some of the films that you have experienced on oh. your your across the oceans travel? Boy, uh, heaps heaps of stuff. Very eclectic list I have here. First of all, I just do want to say just a, a, a little bit about traveling. Uh, so basically, I, I was traveling around the states, mm. uh, going to my old haunts in Minnesota and elsewhere, and went to LA for a couple of days. And the thing about LA is. I think you just really don't realize until you're there in person how pervasive the film industry yeah. actually is. Yeah. Every billboard, every service, everything's somehow tied into Hollywood. Mm. Especially when you get to Hollywood and then, wow. Yeah. The billboards, I mean, it's it's all, you can see what shows the studios and the, you know, various companies are putting money into. Uh, when I was there, it was Pennyworth, the... Um, the Alfred from Batman backstory that is currently oh. a show, which is okay. I thought, uh, well, out of all the characters, Alfred. I want to know about Alfred. <laughs> wow, that's funny. he sees so much. Yeah, yeah. He, wow. he walks in so many circles. Does he know? <laughs> What does the butler know? Mm. Uh, mm. So there was that, and there was Hobbs and Shaw. Hobbs mm. and Shaw, flyers, bus ads, everything. So I'm really, really surprised that Hobbs and Shaw didn't actually do that well at the domestic box, uh, box office. Interesting. Domestic there or uh, here? Yeah, there. Right, right. Yeah. right. Uh, and then I, I was very, very, very fortunate uh, for my relatives to take me to the Griffiths Observatory. Oh, which yeah. Is, you know, such a... Such a scenic place and so many movies. Such a location, isn't it? Such a location. Is it the La La Land fantasy, it is. fantasy place? And of course, just as you say with the trivia fountain, Sarah, mm. so many people. <laughs> La La Land, it's, it's fantasy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I was also very lucky to be there on the eve of the 50th anniversary for the moon landing. So mm. they had all these events. Cool. Lots of fun stuff. It's also a great work of cinema, I have to say. Yeah. Oh, the movie. Yes, I, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick, you know, a true master. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say, I, I, I saw a couple of really different things uh, throughout, my, throughout my trip. Uh, on the plane, I watched, as I said last episode, I watched Toy Stories 1, 2, and 3, mm-hmm. uh, back to back to mm-hmm. back. Very interesting, interesting experience. I think they they do hold up every single one of them. They are very just feel good movies, but in a way that really makes you think. Yeah. I think every and makes you feel makes you think and feel so yeah. many feels. Yeah. And I do think that all three of the original Toy Stories. It's weird to call three an original Toy Story now. Yeah. But they, they are pioneers of the craft. Mm. The first one being one of the first ever feature-length CGI you know, animated films that changed the industry forever. The second one that is, in my mind, one of the greatest sequels of all time and how they, they kind of had to come up on the fly with something that could be converted from a direct-to-DVD, uh, well, it was VHS, direct-to-VHS sequel into a full-on cinematic production. Mm. I think it was within tw- uh, 24th, not... Fewer months. Have you, have you read stuff. Creativity Inc. and they talk no. about that because Disney came to them and were like, just just put you know put something together, direct to video. It makes money. Doesn't have to be good. And then mm-hmm. Pixar were like, no, that's not the way we roll. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it almost burnt their company out oh because of gosh. the pressure. And so they yeah. had to really take a step back Whew. and like, how can we keep producing co- co- quality content without burning our people out? Yeah. But I agree with you. It's one of the first animated sequels that's yeah. actually any good. It's <laughs> a- incredible. And it does everything you want a sequel to do and so much more. Like mm. it, it deepens the characters. It gives them meaningful choices to make. Such a good movie. And then three, of course, with the ending and everything. Uh, I was going to say, which is the one with the ending, yeah. <laughs> where I was nearly in tears and absolutely horrified. So yeah. that must be number three. Yeah. It elevates. And, and you guys, I think you talk, well, I talk definitely talked about it in my chat when, in our last podcast, and I'm pretty sure you guys did too. Um, those of you listening, if you haven't listened to our last episode, William and I had two separate conversations that were edited together. Um, <laughs> about Toy Story 4. four. And 
all the other Toy Stories. Yeah, yeah. And just how the last two particularly. I, love, I mean, Pixar in general, they, they're dealing with heavy, massive adult or human themes. Mm. Not yeah. adult themes, because they're for kids as well, but man, they're sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm so glad these movies exist. Mm. I mean, in the, in the sea, and we talked about this last uh, last month as well, in the sea of mediocrity of mm. kids' fart jokes, and mm. you have these movies talk about life, parenthood, the afterlife, you know, responsibility, mm, mm. amazing stuff. Have you amazing. seen Toy Story 4? I have not yet, no. It's because I felt that I needed to rewatch at least three mm. and probably one, two, and three. And ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> if, you, if you think of it, and William, you can disagree or, or agree, mm. if you think of it as an epilogue, because it's mm. pretty much Woody's story. Right. The other, like Buzz Bailey gets a look at it. Is it like an origin story? No. No, no. no, no. But it's, it's his beautiful. story. It's beautiful. Right. Yeah. It's quite profound. Same voices, same actors. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I'd be gutted if they tutted with that. Well, there's a couple of people that have passed away, so they've, they've found ways to... Then got different Don Don Rickles with Potato Head and right, some right, yeah, yeah. Slinky Dog passed away a while yeah. ago. Um, so I saw that. I saw some some fluff. I saw Thor Ragnarok again, which is oh a me lot too. Of fun. Okay, it's so saying. good. I need to rewatch it's it. It's so it's good. very very good. Yeah, and I watched um, Eagle vs Shark with my sister. Oh. I've never seen it before, and it's brilliant as well. S- speaking of um, on the plane, I, I always I always like to dive into New Zealand movies. So mm. when, when you told me you watched Vi, I was like, I watched I watched Vi as well. Okay, well, let's talk about that soon. Okay, I'm keen to okay, um, a really interesting experience. But also, I saw the Breakout Bros. Oh, oh yeah. um, have you guys seen that? Yes, I started started to. Did you laugh like a drain because you were on a plane and because they were like <laughs> pumping more oxygen, oxygen into the atmosphere? I always cry on a plane Same. so easily. The ones for warriors tore me to shreds. <laughs> well, that does oh. anyway. No, but it was like worse <laughs> on a plane. I always um, love watching uh, romantic comedies. I laugh and laugh and <laughs> you cry. Know why? It's the oxygen. So this yeah. is what I want to know. This is you're the control to my experiment. Aha! Uh-huh. Was Breaker Upper is hilarious? Uh, oh, I, I thought it was pretty funny. See? <laughs> <laughs> that's that their oxygen. I mean, uh, it's good, listeners. Don't worry, I'm not slagging it off. But you know, yeah. I I think okay. It it is a movie where I I mean, for those who don't know, it, it came out in 2018. I think it was the highest grossing New Zealand movie of that year mm. in New Zealand. Um, so it's it's written directed by uh, Madeline Sami and Jackie Van Der Beek or Van Beek. Yeah. Um, who. I think they have a really good chemistry together. Yeah. They, you know, they're both an eagle versus shark. They, and I didn't realize <laughs> until I was watching. They both have small little roles. And I was like, oh, gosh. Yeah. The Taika mm-hmm. Waititi kind of mm-hmm. connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's it's just, guys, it's so nice to, it? to see something filmed in Auckland. Yeah. And that plays such a big part in the story. Like, uh, Auckland, you see South Auckland, Central Auckland, downtown, see it a little bit of East. And it's it's so good to have a story that takes place at home and uses our locations. And I know that place. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a really good feeling when leaving Auckland. Yes, I hear you. When you're away, <laughs> that sort of thing's very affecting and yeah. lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's like my um, auntie. I, I stayed with her early in the year in um, in Bali, actually. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to her about just various bits and pieces. And one of the things I suggested to her was a couple of New Zealand books. And of course, she's overseas, and it's the same thing. It's like she's yeah. reading things from her home, and it's, there's something quite special about mm. that. I think I'm somebody who really, really loved the film Number Two mm. um, more I than love the film. But I loved it. I was in I was in living in London when I watched it. Whereas I remember at the time, people were a bit meh mm. about it. Whereas for me, and the, and Whale Rider also very affecting by being yeah. abroad. That's another film in Sydney, Auckland, West Auckland. Well, <laughs> Mount, <coughs> not, not West Auckland, Mount Roskill. It's central Auckland. Yeah, that's right. That's a beautiful, beautiful mm. film. It's like when uh, when the Olympics were on, and I was in the <clears> states, and every time New Zealand would get a medal, and the anthem started playing, I would start tearing up. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. just saw so, something about something about home. My home, yes, there is. My home does yeah. exist. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And we row, we yeah. row. Uh, so, so I saw that. Well, I saw a couple of things. Um, uh, Hobbs and Shaw, which I think Sarah, you and I can talk about. Yes, it was, it was fun. It yeah. was. Are you a fan of the, or are you guys fans of the Fast and Furious movies? Increasingly, yes. The back okay. end of them, absolutely. Good, good. Um, I thought they'd been <laughs> terrific. I, was, I still haven't seen any of them. <gasps> See, yeah. Hobson Shaw, I think, got some criticism for not really being much of a car chase movie, barring the, 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 the end, which is pretty car chasey and pretty great, <laughs> even if it's CGI. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it, mm-hmm. but I didn't have any skin in the game, by mm-hmm. which I mean I didn't have to have an official view of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was freshly back from overseas and kind of just like, yay, 
you know, whatever. Um, but I did delight in the Samoa slash New Zealand aspects of it. But at the same time, I, I always struggle. And this is one of my issues with Thor Ragnarok and the marvelous rock character. Tell me his name again. Korg. 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 Um, how everybody falls over themselves to like just be completely enamored of him. And for me, and it's for me, it's also like hearing Zoe Bell in a Tarantino film. For some reason, it is a little bit, um, it takes me out of it a little bit. Uh, and, and, and I know for, for a lot of us, it's thrilling to see representations of home or what we know or what we hear around on screen. And I think sometimes for me, it's just a little bit, it, it's too, um, not disjunctive. I can't oh. think what the word is maybe, but yeah. Oh, I, I do have many feelings on this, but first of all, to the table, how did you guys feel about watching Star Wars episode two, Attack of the Clones? Where yeah. Obi Wan goes to the clone planet, and then suddenly Timothy Morrison comes out, and, and they his son Daniel like Logan, him. and Daniel Logan goes like, "Oh yeah, Dad, Tom Way's here." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it is the strangest movie, the strangest move in a Star Wars movie <laughs> it's ever. Awful. It's awful. He did, Don Way's here. <laughs> Oh, like get him, that? Dad! Get yeah. him! Isn't it a bit like that in Aquaman as well? There's something weird in Aquaman. Oh, his, uh, T- Tim's accent in Aquaman is all over the place. And and w- so for me, it, that does not work. <laughs> Aquaman is all over the yeah. place. Sure. And then <laughs> Cliff Curtis's accent in Hobbs and Shaw is also really strange. Yeah. That took me way out. Yeah, no. Nah. I think um, I feel like there's a case to be made, though. <laughs> Attack of the Clones aside, I think there's a case to be made for just the... We're just not used to hearing something so familiar amidst something so familiar. Like it's we're so familiar to the American films, yeah. and we're so familiar to our own accent in another context. It's, it's that, the it's other that context clashing of it together. <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's so um, yeah, it's just out of context. But I think see, I'd love to know what it felt like for an American to watch, for example, Thor Ragnarok, or indeed Hobbs and Shaw. Because for them, there's probably an exoticism, mm-hmm. and I know that's a, a, a dangerous word, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. There's an exoticism, perhaps, at the South Pacific, um, and and therefore, it, so it's a foreign land, and therefore, whatevs, anywhere, great, you know. Um, may, maybe it's the same for Chinese audiences watching films like, um, maybe not The Great Wall is not a good example, but films, you know, where, where Hollywood films, where they go to China, yeah. or something. Uh, you know? crazy, uh, crazy Rich Asians, absolutely, sure, yeah. sure. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, oh, look, there's a whole other podcast around <laughs> representation mm. and around seeing yourself on screen, Can, can, et cetera, can we just talk cetera, about that but... real quick, just in Hobbs and Shaw? Because yeah. I, I also, I had the exact same feeling watching the end of that movie. So spoilers, well, not really, because it's, it's in the trailer which shows the entire movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the end of the movie, the Vanessa Kirby character, she has a super, super nanovirus in her body that's going to kill her in 12 hours, I think. Yeah. And so Dwayne Rock Johnson says, all right, I got it. There's one man that can help you. He's my bro. He's Cliff Curtis. And he's across the other side of the world in Samoa. So let's go to Samoa for our fourth act. They filmed in Hawaii. They filmed in Hawaii. And it it doesn't look like Samoa. Here's the thing. But But it does if you're foreign and you don't know. (laughs) You know what I mean? Pacific Island. And so watching watching the end of Hobbs and Shaw, I had the exact same feeling watching Moana as well. Disney's Moana. And that... The representation was really cool, and I know people are really positive about it. And you know, you watch interviews with The Rock, and he is he is all about it. He's yeah. saying, you know, his mother was his, crying because his mum is um, Samoan. Yes, yeah. yes, his mum, you know, was Auckland. You know, yeah. <laughs> um, but he, it, it obviously means a lot to him and a lot to the people involved. And he learned actual his line, lines properly in Samoan, yeah. which he doesn't speak, so he could enunciate them properly. Yep. And and then I talk to my you know my Samoan students and they just laugh at it and, and think you know oh yeah so he's super plastic he yeah. sounds really weird and it's just really orcs to see everything play out like that yeah but then and then of course my, my students kind of react to Moana in the same way and then I talk to other people and Moana has such a profound impact on especially from from what i see on the people of the south pacific living you know around us in auckland yeah. people instead of wearing frozen backpacks are wearing moana backpacks Absolutely. there's moana knockoff toys at flea markets to this day like it's a really big deal I was yeah. talking to my friend denise about i mean she saw moana in samoa and apparently people were crying in the cinema because it was so profound yes but on the other hand there's still just that disconnect because moana I think it's a very American story mm. featuring an American lead who just happens to look 
someone or to look like someone from the South Pacific. But mm. she could therefore be Hawaiian, which is American. Th- that's true. That's true. <coughs> but it just, there is that disconnect in my yeah. mind. It's, it feels kind of exploitative, but also representative. Yeah. Kind of, this is about diversity and in- inclusivity, but also that exoticism but still not you're talking right. about. Exactly. Not, not quite right. Because the filmmakers are mostly white American males. Yeah. Uh, and they come from a place which has a very, very different culture. Yes. Can, can we talk about Vi then? Because uh-huh. I feel like this is a, it's a good segue. I mean, it's almost like a starting point. It's like you need Once Were Warriors to be able to then talk back to it with, with Whale Rider and, and arguably you need Once Were Warriors. But I mean, that was a really significant film in terms of Māori cinema and highlighting a really specific... Um, community, mm. but it's pretty horrific. Mm. So you, you know what I mean? Like that's a starting point, and we've had a whole range of really wonderful Māori cinema since then. In terms of Pacific Pacifica cinema, there's not a lot at all, no. and anything that there is is generally pretty awful. I've seen some terrible. Oh, oh, some oh terrible I, I, but the Pacific Orator films. was very well regarded, yeah, which was the first Samoan language feature film, and um, one a thousand ro- one thousand ropes. I thought was excellent. And it is a, it's largely based in New Zealand, but it's Samoan. Um, and that was a fantastic film. Then you've got, bless him, Stalo, Stallone um, uh, Vaonga, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, who made Three Wise Cousins. Uh, and, and Hibiscus and Ruthless. And yeah. just coming out any minute now um, <laughs> is Take Home Pay, mm-hmm. um, which I've watched the trailer of many times. I watched it with my Pacifica students yesterday, and they absolutely loved it because you've got very famous Samoan actors um, doing jokey Samoan things in Auckland and all that. Yeah. But anyway, so so I hear what you're saying. It's but still it, limited, though, right? It, absolutely. It's, it's, in it's terms of how many but... how many people live in, you know, how many of our our people are <laughs> yeah. from a Pacific island? And uh, uh, well, kind of bouncing off Vi specifically, but also uh, like the Orator <laughs> um, and, and some of the other movies there. It, it's so interesting. I think the the movies coming out of this place, whether mm. it is uh, a New Zealand production or a South Pacific production, mm. it seems like a lot of them are either very, very serious, yes, quite earnest. grassroots, yeah. earnest dramas, yeah. or like goofy comedies, and there isn't a lot of, you know, space around it. Mm. Um, and maybe that's just the way the industry is progressing, mm. but it's just, it seems like every time I, I watch a similar movie of this ilk, it's like, wow, this is... You know, people are taking either taking it very, very seriously, yeah, or kind of being as frivolous as you can get. Mm, interesting. I, th- I think it is. I think it is a case of a very sort of. Um, I don't want to say a new industry necessarily, but it's a new area of an industry for sure. Um, and I, at least I, I feel as though. See, people have made. Um, comment of the fact that Cliff Curtis actually is not Pacifica, he's Māori. Um, and so I get why you cast Cliff Curtis in the role in Hobbs and Shaw, because he is probably the uh, preeminent um, Māori slash Pacifica um, actor working in Hollywood today. I mean, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, he's played every culture, though. Yes, he <laughs> has. Every vaguely <laughs> brown <laughs> culture, yeah. But here's the thing, right? Collateral um, damage. So, you know, so... And I can't speak for how 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 well he sounded, but he definitely, you know, it wasn't great. Um, but so the difficulty is, and look, there is a whole other podcast to be done on representation because yes, efforts are being made, but they haven't yet nailed it. Mm-hmm. And so there are issues of well, could they not have found a Samoan actor to play that role? Mm-hmm. Um, and oh yeah, arguably they could have, but he wouldn't have had Cliff Curtis's standing, and therefore would that have made a difference? Uh, to, I don't know, whatever, box office or whatever. I mean, Cliff Curtis yeah. was flown in to be at the premiere of Hobson Shaw that I went to. Wow. I mean, bless. You know, cool. he might have been in town for some other reason as well. I don't know. But he was sort of, you know, uh, they, they brought him around the different cinemas and he said kia ora to everyone. And, and it was, that was cute. Cool. That was nice. Um, but uh, so anyway, I think there's a lot of work to be done in mm. terms of the representation and in terms of having a Moana that doesn't have an American accent and things. Mm. But it's baby steps, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I guess. agree. Sure. I mean, so for me, I was on a plane to Mumbai. Well, I don't know, if, you know, on my journey to Mumbai, um, and I was so excited to see Vi on the options of the New Zealand flight because I hadn't seen it. And my friend um, Agnes Milford, yeah. who she, I work with her and, and connected with her through through the theatre as well, um, she's one of the. 
um, eight, is it eight stories? Mm-hmm. Eight leads. Um, she sort of closes off. Because it's meant to be like Waru, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, she closes off the uh, the sort of the youthful four stories um, as New Zealand born Samoan trying to survive in, in university. And I cried when she came on screen because I was so proud of her. Mm. It is um, so cool to see her on screen. And then I just and cried in terms of the story as well. <laughs> I've it's not so seen real. it yet. So and it's yeah. all every every chapter is one shot, bar yeah. a couple of cuts and some of the other ones. Yeah, of which is super super impressive. I, I don't did not realize the film was going to be like that. Why do, neither. Why do yeah. did that? Right. Did you, you haven't seen Wadu? No, Wadu? I haven't seen Wadu. And, and oh, my God. Have you seen uh, Wadu? No, no. Oh, my God. Wadu was oh. extraordinary. So that's why it will be very similar. Eight stories, oh. uh, all one yeah. one long 10-minute, I think. I think there were eight 10-minute stories. Mm. Um, one mm-hmm. one shot. Mm. Extraordinary. Is, is Wadu, because in, in Vai, it's one character kind of spiritually, I guess, through the stories and that... Vi is the central character. She has the same sort of family, familial connection. Is she the same actress? In no, each? and it's different. Right. It's a different, um, a different Pacific version Island, of her. Different yeah. Pacific Island for each of the places. So a different version of her. Yeah. Right. Um, so Wadu is slightly different because the sort of the intersecting set of Wadu is the um, the tonguey of a small child who's been killed um, at, in the, at the hands of. I, th- I think we think or know that it's the child has died at the hands of its family mm. uh, and so the characters are all related in some way right but it isn't quite um what is it like the player or whatever where you've got your intersecting oh, sets yeah. of characters it's or not, Ma- magnolia or magnolia it's yeah. not quite like that it's just the provocation that's been given to them mm. absolutely and i can't now remember whether people do recur i think there may be a couple of tiny mm. instances but it isn't it isn't it's not explicitly like that, but mm. the thread is that it is all around the. It's the different the people in the community affected by this this death, mm. um, which is a terrific central conceit, and obviously also makes it an, a really heart rending film to watch. Mm. Um, so yes, yeah, so they will have done a similar sort of oh, thing because Vi must be eight in Samoan, am I right? Uh, Vi is water. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, fine, yeah. fine. So they've all got it. So they all have to have a connection to water. <coughs> mm. Ah, right, nice. So there is at least a thematic. Yeah, mm. it's it's lovely. I mean, definitely yeah. some stories are stronger than others, mm-hmm. I think. But um, it's a pretty compelling piece of cinema. Yeah. Interesting, though. Again, you saw it outside of New Zealand. I couldn't. Get, I couldn't access it at the time. Like it was in some theater, a couple of theaters that were like a bit of a drive away, and mm-hmm. I just. Was very. I was doing two shows, and I just couldn't get but the I time think to drive. Makes a really there. interesting point that our. I think context increasingly. I think from my experience over the last five months, context is huge in my experience of appreciating a film or not. Mm. And I do think it's really significant to watch something that is from home or from something familiar, yeah. um, which for all of us, um, the Pacifica uh, community is very familiar because we ha- we either do or have taught. Pacifica students at some stage so it's really interesting to be outside of that environment and then to experience culture Mm -hmm. Mm. um, from there and to feel quite differently about it I think sometimes than when you're at, at home yeah. Yeah. Especially on the plane, like leaving leaving your home. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm going to watch all these New Zealand things. After I've done Toy Story one, uh, two, after three. After the Toy yeah, Story right. marathon, <laughs> uh, can I can I just say one more thing about Hobbs and Shaw? Yeah. And that, that is Idris Elba. Yeah. He. I'll just say this. I, I enjoy the Fast and Furious franchise greatly. Mm. Um, I think Fast and Furious 8 is, or Fate of the Furious is it's kind of a step down. But I, I do think 5, 6, and 7, especially 5 and 7, are some of the greatest dumb action movies ever. Mm. Like it's, The action is so well shot, and mm. the characters are so well formed in this goofy kind of way that they're just a lot of fun to watch. Mm. Um, I felt Hobbs and Shaw lacked a lot of that, but mm. uh, until Idris Elba came on screen, and every time he was on screen, I just had this goofy grin on my face because mm. he he's loving it. Mm. And Sarah, did you realize that on the soundtrack there is a song written by Idris Elba, sang by Idris Elba about his character Brixton? I don't remember that. Okay. No, um, guys, can I recite the song now? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so, because it's amazing. So. It's called Even If I Die. Hold on, um, listeners, you can't see this, but he's doing it from memory. <laughs> so, go, William. I listened to this on loop. So, <laughs> here we go. Here's the, the, the just Elba rap part. So, oh, okay. 
I got a good side, I got a bad side, I got a monkey on my back and I call him pride. I got mean streak, I don't care to hide, I'll fight for my boys even if I died. I got one heart, I got two fists, I'm a dirty fire, not a strategist. In two minutes I will take out your man, and I'll take out your man like a toothpick, I think is how the lyric goes. Right. <laughs> okay, um, something wicked this way do come, sitting on two wheels, because he rides a motorbike that transforms. Um, <laughs> carrying two guns, with a bulletproof suit feeling like a champion, call me Brick. I'm Black Superman. I am the evolution of man. I'm gonna win any way that I can. I'll go to war just the way that I am. I'll go to war. I'll go to war. Yeah, uh, uh, just poetry. <laughs> poetry. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I particularly like his line, something wicked this way comes. No, some, this That's way do genius. come. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's genius. Yeah, yeah. Shakespeare or someone should yeah. use that. That's amazing. I think it's from Harry Potter 3. Oh, so. right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm. I, I I am really glad that he is having fun. That's uh, awesome. And he, I mean, it, it shows shows up on screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, as we come in for a close, I'm keen to hear about in terms of having fun. I'm keen to hear about how about can. Yes. So um, let's hear your can reflections in five minutes. Because yes. can you do it in five minutes? Sure. So um, well, actually, we had two film festivals left to go to. The first was the Cannes Film Festival, a little known festival <laughs> in the south of France. It's been going for a trillion years. Mm-hmm. Um, Cannes was uh, twelve days of queuing up for films. Um, but also getting to see films before anybody else in the world, including Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I, um, my husband was in a, he had a different badge category than me and uh, was in a, a lower level queue for a long time uh, and was unable to get into the film. I queued for two and a half hours to see mm-hmm. Quentin's film, the last hour of which I was um, crammed under a staircase under the armpits of several <laughs> uh, very, very warm film reviewers from around the world. Um, and uh, so anyway, the privilege of Cannes is getting to see films first and also the luminaries from those films, and I know I overused that line, being there for the press conferences afterwards. Now, while I personally had no direct interaction with anybody, I sat in at the press conference for Rocket Man, for example, um, and there, there was Taron Egerton and Dexter Fletcher and um, Bryce Dallas Howard and so on. Um, and my husband got to interview Bong Joon-ho, whose film Parasite, oh, mm. we'd sat and oh, abs- oh. the brilliant thing about a lot of the things that can is if you don't read any material beforehand, you can go into things absolutely unspoiled. Um, and Parasite is definitely a film about which the less you know, the better. Um, which will be a bit, little bit difficult now because people will know some stuff, but whatever. Um, even try to avoid the, what, to watch the trailer if you can. So Parasite was absolutely gobsmackingly amazing. And then Doug actually got to interview him for 40 minutes, one-on-one, um, and has written a wow. terrific piece. A, hey, He's written a terrific piece that will be in Filmmaker Magazine, US Filmmaker Magazine, uh, in the, sometime later this year. And then Bong Joon-ho won the Palm Door for Parasite, which was thrilling and wonderful. But other highlights for me there was a fantastic French film uh, set in contemporary, nowadays, the, the banlieue, the, the outer suburbs of Paris, uh, very much gang warfare, d- dirty cops, corruption, immigrant families, etc., called Les Miserables. Mm. And the challenge there, of course, is inevitably we call it Les Mis. Uh, it's Les Miserables. There is no musical. There are no musical numbers in it, and it is not that film. But I absolutely loved it, found it thrilling. Mm. It's in the film festival that's traversing New Zealand at the moment, and I highly recommend people go. Again, the less you know, the better. Uh, and a th- an incredible film called Baccarat, um, which was Brazilian. I don't even know why I went other than the fact that it was in competition and you just go. And it is a film that there's no point in my even telling you anything. Because even if I <laughs> gave you the log line, a uh, young woman returns to her village um, to attend a funeral you'd be like, oh, yeah, sounds like a nice sort of Central South American kind of movie. It goes places you have no idea it's going to go. And it was absolutely extraordinary. And, in fact, back around Les Miserables took out the joint uh, third prize at Cannes. Mm. So that was thrilling and wonderful. Sylvester Stallone was there in conversation. He was thrilling and wonderful. 
what a lovely man. Wow. And the thing that touched me so much, <laughs> seriously, I know. Yeah. The thing that touched me so much was this extraordinary humility and a very genuine humility. And the thing that really moved me was when he spoke, um, nobody had said to him, how come you come across as such a dafty? Everyone thinks you're an idiot. But he volunteered that. Apparently at birth there was a, an accident during his being born that affected his mouth and his jaw. Mm. And that's why he speaks with that sort of slurry sound. Mm. And the number of people I've spoken to who have said, oh, has he had too many hits to the head? And quite sort of sneery things, which I think we all sort of assumed, you know, he's a good action hero, but he's never going to do anything particularly clever. And to realize that actually he has grown up being underestimated. I mean, he doesn't pretend to be an intelligent so man. So he really is Rocky. <laughs> he <laughs> is the he underdog. He literally is. Now, he, I always forget this, I don't remember if he wrote Rocky. He, he, he wrote, directed, and starred in it, right? So yeah. therefore, he feels very connected to Rocky's story and Rocky's character. And it was a really big deal for him. I mean, he talked through the whole production process mm. about getting that film made, and there's, there are loads of anecdotes that are wonderful in that regard. Incidentally, he still has the two turtles, or tortoises that are now huge. Wow! Um, oh my gosh. Um, and he still he, he still oh has them gosh. as pets thirty odd years later, which is delightful. Forty years. What I a don't great know. symbol of his career, right? Really. Yeah. But yeah, it was wonderful to hear from him and to him for him to speak so proudly about working in Copland, which I remember at the time was the film where all of a sudden he's do, he's playing. Admittedly, he's a burly bugger in that, you know, but he's um, a cop who's deaf in one ear and. Uh, uh, and and is playing a proper hero rather than a an action hero and stuff. So Sylvester was lovely and just such a decent, wonderful fellow. And I will just quickly say, we don't I don't need to belabor this. But after Can, but wait, there's more. <laughs> we went to Bologna and we spent uh, eight days at the uh, Il, uh, the Festivale del Cinema Ritrovato, which means refound mm. and restored films. And the whole of Bologna is taken over. Uh, there is a massive, beautiful town square. They put up a huge screen, and every night they play for free, uh, for public uh, consumption, a significant film. And we watch the remastered version of Apocalypse Now. Oh, and even the new one. That the new one. Is, what, the hey, final that's, cut. You know, it's one of my favourite movies, if not. Francis like, was con- there. In contestion with... In contestion? Yeah, we'll go with it. Yeah. With Alien, that's up there. Right. How was it? It was terrific. Oh, I and it. It's terrific. And, um, it, and, and it's funny, you know, that's one of the, another mm. film where I thought I'd seen it, and then I realised I've seen moments from that film that are so sort of entrenched that you feel like you know it and then you watch the whole thing and go, oh, no, I didn't, oh, no, I didn't necessarily know that's what was going to happen. The sound remastering and everything was mm. extraordinary. And we went to a masterclass with Francis Ford Coppola talking <laughs> to um, a whole... What a masterclass. Um, yeah, <laughs> right? A whole theatre full of mostly film students, actually, very keen, because the university in Bologna is a very significant university. Um, and he gave wonderful advice to these young people about how necessary it is to consume art in order to create art. Mm. And he spoke so intelligently about novels and authors and art and music and things, which, you know, I thought was terrific. So Apocalypse Now, um, the piano. On our last night, Jane Campion's oh, The Piano. Wow. And Jane was there. She oh, taught the audience wow. to Hongi, wow. uh, which is slightly awkward, but never <laughs> mind. Um, and, uh, and she introduced the film. So the piano on the big screen in the square was magnificent. And also just a, a plethora of films, silent films, black and white films, wonderful film noir, like The, Double, the Devil Thumbs a Ride, which has introduced us to Lawrence Tierney, who was in Reservoir Dogs, because, as you know, Quentin is so good at picking, plucking somebody from is yesteryear. He the, is he the, the, the leader of them? He's the old guy. Yeah, He's right. He's old. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I want to say... Um, Ed, Eddie. No, he's not. No, he's not Eddie. He's no. his son. So he's, he's the guy that, but, that hires them all. That basically, yeah. exactly. So yeah. to watch young Lawrence Tierney, we watched a, three or four Lawrence Tierney films. It was just marvellous. Um, and interesting documentaries, uh, South Korean films, um, uh, and, and uh, a tour of the restoration uh, uh, mechanisms in Bologna. Because at the Cineteca in Bologna, that's where the world's restorations happen so we got to look at stuff that was far too technically challenging for me but for Doug and other people it was apparently exhilaratingly thrilling you know to to actually go down into the the gunnels of the the buildings and see how stuff is uh, treated Mm. and restored in that so you know really thrilling 
wonderful things to do. And then at the very, very end in London, we went to the Kubrick exhibition at the Design Museum, which you in particular, Jeremy, would have absolutely loved with um, authentic, what do I mean, like real props and pieces of script that Stanley typed and wrote and wow. letters wow. sent to, like letters to the editor, letters to the director. Dear sir, I have recently seen your film Clockwork Orange and it was disgusting. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like real pieces of memorabilia. Um, extraordinary, I mean, you know all this because you know Kubrick better than anybody, but extraordinary um, binders full of materials that he used for two years to create a film that then never happened yeah. and stuff like that. Oh, my gosh, so, dream. Yeah, so, I mean, as much as the film was also about um, eating and drinking our way around Europe and coming back 10 kilos heavier, you'll be pleased to know I have lost some of that 10 kilos uh, <laughs> since my return. Um, gosh, film loomed very large in the whole trip. I, I mean, it clearly did, because I don't know if you realised it, the slip of the tongue, you actually said rather than saying your trip you said film so oh you know you've conceived of this journey that's right as a as a piece of cinema that's right <laughs> so that was that really yeah cool you know pretty uneventful thank you for listening to another episode of cinema in context if you enjoyed our podcast then please share it with your film loving friends you can listen to cinema in context through soundcloud or apple podcast stitcher or radio public you can follow us on facebook subscribe to us on twitter or youtube which are also great places to let us know what you think of this episode or give us suggestions for future films to discuss and compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time, and until then, ka kite anō.